My name is Elizabeth Alvendorfer, as most of you know. Um, <clears throat> and I'll be presenting today about my project that I did over the summer, um, the Capstone Project, um, doing an evaluation of an environmental education program. Um, thank you to my panel for being here, so Jamie, Brett, and Nina, and thank you to the organizations that I worked with, the Dural Wildlife Conservation Trust and the Mauritian Wildlife Foundation. So this is a little overview of what we will be doing today. Um, I'll do, go through some of the socio-ecological contexts of Mauritius, so livelihoods, education, things like that. Uh, overview of the partners I worked with, the uh, education program I worked with, co-learning with nature, um, and then go into my study methodology, results, outcomes, etc., and some reflections and lessons learned from uh, this past summer. So, this past summer, I took a very long journey to the middle of the Indian Ocean to a little island called Mauritius. It is right here. It's about 500 miles off of the east coast of Madagascar. Here's a little bit of a better view for you. And then the real life view. I did not take this picture, but I thought it was beautiful. <laughs> and I'll be playing a video for you just so you don't get bored with just me talking. So Mauritius is this beautiful mix of cultures and languages and ecosystems. Um, there are about 1.3 million people living in Mauritius. The um, main language is Mauritian Creole, so that's a mix between French and African languages and many different influences. Um, although people, many people speak French and the official language is English. Um, the uh, backgrounds of people who live in Mauritius are Chinese, Indian, African, European, basically anywhere you can think of people come from. The three main, what the government calls the main pillars of the economy are manufacturing, um, agriculture, and tourism. And tourism in particular is the section that has been growing the most throughout the years. Um, as far as livelihoods go, people fish, um, people work in the tourism industry, so that's either in uh, hotels and resorts or as skippers. Um, they work growing and harvesting sugarcane and fruit um, and work in the manufacturing sector as well. So over the years, the population in Mauritius has continued to grow as well as, unfortunately, um, income inequality and relative poverty. Um, also, unfortunately, there has been a long history in Mauritius of um, habitat destruction and disruption. So this started about 400 years ago with the arrival of the Dutch. Um, they settled in Mauritius, began uh, mass deforestation, um, and then that continued on with the French and the British colonizations. Um, and then the French and British actually established a ton of sugarcane estates, um, which was partly because of deforestation. And they started uh, the beginning of indentured, indentured labor, sorry, and introducing um, invasive species of plants and animals as well. So just to give you an idea of the destruction that these these people had. This was the home of the dodo. Obviously, it's not around anymore. <laughs> uh, Mauritius is an IUCN center of plant diversity. It's also a biodiversity hotspot. And as with many of these isolated areas, there is a ton of endemism. This is my favorite video. <laughs> There's a ton of endemism um, on the island plants and animals. Um, and there are many issues with conservation and sustainability on this island, as you can imagine as well. Um, there are legacy effects from that deforestation and introduction of invasive species. Um, there is a conflict between fruit growers and fruit bats, unfortunately. Um, there is continuing development for tourism and for um, the growing population and of course climate change which is affecting everything these days. 
Um, luckily, the Mauritian government, as well as companies and NGOs, are taking steps toward sustainability and toward um, saving these unique environments. So, uh, for example, the government participated in the Millennium Development Goals in the UN 2030 um, Agenda for Sustainable Development. And there are many strategic plans for tourism and for national parks um, that have been implemented as well. Uh, education is also a big part of, of the Mauritian government's plan. So it was a part of the Millennium Development Goals. And as of 2014, um, both enrollment in primary and secondary schools, as well as uh, literacy for people between the ages of 15 to 24 uh, reached almost 100%, which is very promising. <laughs> um, the government also implemented a what they call the Corporate Social Responsibility Policy, uh, which essentially is organizations that take part of their incomes and put them toward um, programs that, let me get the direct quote here, programs that contribute to the social and environmental development of the country. Um, and one of the organizations I worked with, the Mauritian Wildlife Foundation, um, takes part in this policy. And many of the school groups who do the program um, receive funding from that policy and, and get their programs paid for. Okay, stop this a little short. So. There we go. <laughs> so speaking of the organizations I worked with, um, my main partner was the Dural Wildlife Conservation Trust, and they are based out of Jersey. Um, they are close partners with the Mauritian Wildlife Foundation, and this is one of the main conservation organizations, excuse me, in Mauritius. Um, I do apologize in advance for the acronyms that you might be seeing there. <laughs> A few that you'll be seeing in the following slides. So, uh, Dural Wildlife Conservation Trust, I'll just be calling Dural because it's quicker. Uh, Mauritian Wildlife Foundation, you'll see it as <coughs> MWF, but I'll be saying MWAF. Um, so, just so you know, and then there will be a couple others I'll, I'll let you know about as well. Um, so like I said, these two organizations have worked together for uh, several years um, doing these five main goals here. So I'll read a few of them to you. Establishing protected areas. Um, this includes the islet that I uh, worked on with the education program, Ilo Zegret, um, that, I, that Brett and I introduced you to earlier. Um, and then they also raise awareness for species protection, and uh, this is in the form, partly in the form of that uh, environmental education program that I evaluated. Um, and like I said before, that program is called Learning with Nature. Um, it was established in 2009 um, as a partnership between MOF, Dural, and the Chester Zoo, and it takes place on Ilo Zegret. Uh, Ilo Zegret is a um, protected area, and MOF has restored it, has restored its ecosystem to one that you would have found in Mauritius about 400 years ago. So that's before the arrival of all of those humans and that destruction. And I'll go through a little bit of what it's like to do the Learning with Nature program. Again, another video. This is from when um, I visited Ilo Zegret. Um, so it's not exactly the experience that students have, but I'll give you a good idea of it. So, imagine with me, if you will, just for a second, that you are um, back in school. So you're 12, 13, 14 years old. Um, you're living in Mauritius, which just imagine that. <laughs> and you're learning about <clears throat> history and geography and science and conservation in school, but you don't necessarily get the chance to um, see or do these things in person. 
uh, or go to these places that you're learning about. So your teacher or your school might decide that the Learning with Nature program will be really beneficial for your class to actually interact with these types of things. Um, so you take about a five minute motorboat ride to this tiny little island um, as you saw earlier in the video. <laughs> And you do uh, a loop around the island for about an hour and a half and learn, learn and interact uh, in a few interesting ways. So you learn about conservation firsthand. You get to see plant propagation, um, the plant nursery, the giant tortoise nursery. You get to actually speak with conservationists on the island. Um, you reflect on humans' um, roles in the ecosystem as well as the differences between this environment on Ilo Zigret um, versus the main island of Mauritius. Um, and you get to interact with some of the animals. So as you saw earlier, um, touching the tortoise um, or seeing Mauritian fadis, which is a little bird, uh, endemic bird in Mauritius, mm -hmm. or seeing the uh, fruit bat. It's not a nursery, but a fruit bat area. <laughs> All right, you can come back to the present now. So in uh, 2015, about 4,700 students were able to have this experience. Um, some of those groups received what they called specialized programs, which is essentially um, classes who already had conservation work within their curriculum. Um, so they received that specialized specifically for conservation work, um, learning with nature program. Um, it is also important to note that MOAF has a target demographic that they try to get to do the learning with nature program. So that's 12 to 14 year olds and classes that actually want to integrate the program into their curriculum. And there are groups that don't fall within this demographic. Um, which I will explain a little bit later, but younger or older kids um, and groups that might not even, um, the program doesn't tie in with their curriculum. So uh, essentially, like I said before, what I was there to do was to do an evaluation. I spoke with leaders of Durrell and MOAF um, to decide what would be most beneficial for them um, and they kind of told me that a deeper, um, a deeper evaluation of the impact was most important to them. So essentially what that meant was something other than knowledge gain or more detail on knowledge gain or something like that. So these were the objectives that I came up with for my full project. Create a theory of change, assess students' attitudes, explore the impact of the program, and um, get some recommendations for the program as well. It's a little overwhelming, I apologize. <laughs> you don't have to read all of it. Uh, so I first started with a theory of change and this for me was just a way to really pinpoint what was most important to actually measure in this evaluation. Um, the Learning with Nature program did not have a theory of change already in place, so I basically started from scratch. I did a couple of things. I interviewed the executive director of MOAF, and I also interviewed the education, you can see here, the education programs manager at the Chester Zoo, and she was a big part of the actual development of the program in 2009 when it started. Um, I also did a very short, um, literature review, if you can call it that, so of uh, learning with nature documents. So um, I went over the teacher's packet, which teachers get before they go on the program. The uh, program launch document that was published in 2009 when the program first started. And then the program brochure, which is more of a, um, it goes out to everyone, essentially just explain what the program is about. Um, yeah, so like I said, there are lots of things to read on here. The most important two are right here, these darkest green sections. Those were the two outcomes that were emphasized the most in um, 
the literature review and especially in those interviews, which I thought was the most important. <clears throat> excuse me, the most important. So they are positive attitude toward conservation and positive attitude toward Mauritian ecosystems. Those are the two outcomes that I focused on um, in this evaluation. <laughs> All right, so uh, I first, I, how did I measure these two outcomes? So that was attitude toward conservation and attitudes toward Mauritian ecosystems. Um, I went to the source, so those students who had done the program as well as um, some of the teachers who had gone with their students to do this program. Um, I'm going to start with the teacher interviews. I asked the teachers a couple things. I wanted to get a little more context as to um, why they decided to take the trip, um, as well as their past experiences with conservation and with MOAF and things like that. Um, and I also wanted to get their impressions of the impact of the program on their students. So just kind of another way to um, measure this impact through a different set of eyes, I guess you could say. So why did classes take the trip? For many of them, it was just part of their school curriculum. It was part of that target demographic that MOAF wants to take the program. It's all tied in. For some of them, it was just a field trip to get out of the classroom, to um, get the kids more excited about learning in a different environment. For some, it was a celebratory trip. So it was the end of a grading period. They wanted to celebrate with their classes, get out of the classroom again. Um, and then for some, there was no really no connection with classes. Um, the teacher or the school just felt that it was beneficial for the students and it was a good way to get that firsthand interaction. And I did, I interviewed uh, 12 teachers here. Um, so what were the teachers and students' past experiences? So almost all of the teachers who I interviewed and almost all the students who they spoke for um, were brand new to Ilos de Gret, so it was their first trip there. They had some science or conservation background, so um, that's in the classroom. And for almost all of them, it was their first experience with moth and conservation firsthand. Um, and then with the rest of the interviews, I asked about the impact that it had on their students. Um, I tried to pull um, some themes from those conversations. I found one, <laughs> uh, which was novelty of the ecosystem. So that's essentially saying that the students were amazed by the differences between Ilo Zegret and the main island of Mauritius. They said it was quiet, it was peaceful, they wanted to go back right after they left, um, and they were just kind of in awe of this new environment. I then went on to questionnaires, and this was for, um, the questionnaires were for the students who had gone on the trip. Uh, within the past five months, I believe it was. And I was able to uh, give out 73 questionnaires. I gave them out in person at the schools um, because I figured that would be an easier way to get in contact with those uh, classes. There were a couple um, different sections of this questionnaire. So I asked about attitudes toward the environment and toward nourishing ecosystems, like I said before, those two outcomes I was measuring. I also asked a few questions about um, external influences on these attitudes. So that would be if your family talks about conservation, if your community talks about conservation. Um, because this was just a uh, post-program evaluation, I wasn't able to do comparison before and after. So I kind of wanted to get more context into other influences that might, um, that might influence the attitudes I was measuring. <clears throat> so the first section was on those influences. And I'll try to, oh, it's still kind of hard to read. I apologize. So this is an example of one of the questions that I had. Um, basically, the questionnaire was laid out with 10 of the style questions. Um, so students first would circle one of these two groups. So for example, this one says, some families do not talk about conservation a lot, 
but some families talk about conservation a lot. So if I'm from a family that just does not talk about conservation, I would circle this group, or ideally I would circle this group. Um, I would then uh, say if I really agree with that statement or I only kind of agree with that statement. So that, that's the smiley faces. I agree a little bit, I agree a lot. Um, these answers corresponded with score, so a score of one through four. Um, one being the least environmentally friendly answer, four being the most. So for example in this, if I had a score of one, it would be some families do not talk about conservation a lot. I agree with that a lot, so probably my family really does not talk about conservation ever. Um, on the other hand, a score of four would be some families talk about conservation a lot. I agree with that a lot. My family always talks about conservation. So uh, hopefully that made sense for you. Um, and then I'll go just through some of these pie charts, just a couple interesting um, data points that, that I found interesting at least. So um, for example, 27% of students, as you can see on the far left, 27% of students um, strongly identified with uh, groups who would rather spend time inside rather than outside. Um, on the other hand, the next uh, pie graph over, 87% of students said that they strongly agreed with groups who feel happy in nature. So I thought that was an interesting um, dichotomy there. The next section was on attitudes toward conservation, so one of those outcomes. Um, this example is talking about um, putting tags on birds, so if students think, think it is important to do. Um, that's the middle pie graph here. 56% of students strongly agree with groups who think it's important to do. And I tried to pull uh, a lot of these questions from specific activities that students did on Ilo Zegra. So seeing um, birds with tags on their ankles was one specific um, thing that they could observe on Ilo Zegra. And then Mauritian ecosystems. So this example up here says some kids like to see hares and sparrows, some kids like to see tortoises and pink pigeons. This was the difference between seeing sort of more common um, and invasive, so hares are not supposed to be in Mauritius, um, seeing those types of animals or seeing more unique animals like tortoises and pink pigeons. So 77% of students strongly agree with groups who would rather see those unique um, animals. The last question on the questionnaire was open-ended. It was this question, what is your favorite story to tell about your trip to Ilo Zegret? Uh, I thought this was a really important um, question to add just because it is open-ended. Students could, could be creative if they wanted to. They could write in more detail. They could draw a picture if they wanted to. They could express themselves however they wanted um, in their own way, and it would be an interesting way to figure out the impacts of the program. So I pulled out three themes from these uh, answers to these questions, and about 62 students answered this open-ended question, so not everyone, but enough. Uh, the first was novelty of the ecosystem, which might sound familiar. It is <laughs> the same theme that I pulled from the uh, teacher interviews. So it was interesting to see that, that actually um, came out in the, the student answers as well. So essentially, again, the students were saying that they were amazed by the differences between Ilo Zegret and Mauritius. Um, they wanted to go back to, to Ilo Zegret after they left. Um, they also express pride in these ecosystems, which is promising. So for example, um, student on the bottom, it was a moment of proudness to know that Mauritius got a little island, which is really interesting and beautiful. So that's just expressing this pride in these ecosystems. The next was implications for conservation. So students were, um, expressing 
the impact of conservation on them, on the world, um, their respect for conservationists after having spoken with them on Ilo's Ingrat. So for example here, let's see, on the bottom again, it was a great feeling that people use their time and is dedicated to their job of growing trees. So again, that's just kind of expressing that, that respect for conservationists. I'll give you a second if you want to read the other. So the third theme was connection to nature. And in this theme, students were saying that um, interacting with animals, like I am in the picture there, um, and seeing the plant and animal nurseries and um, feeling peaceful within Ilo Zegret, uh really impacted how they connected with nature and how they felt about nature. So for example, the top quote here, in nature we can express and we can feel something. There's a way to feel some connection. It is a way to feel thoughts and peace without anything to disturb us or change our mind. It is a pleasure. And then there's one about touching twins. <laughs> Um, there were five key outcomes that I found from analyzing all of this data, all this information, um, and I will try to go through them now. So the first was that students are impacted by the environment of Ilo Zegret regardless of the trip's purpose or students' past knowledge. So this was pulled from the uh, teacher interviews. Um, it's essentially saying that regardless of whether the students went to Ilo Zegret with, uh, with the knowledge that they would have to write a paper afterwards, so they would have to really remember everything, or if they were just going to celebrate and they really didn't have to worry about anything there, it had the same impact on everyone. The second outcome was that students tend to identify with groups that positively associate with the environment. So those were the pie charts with the, the pieces of the pie charts that were the darkest green, which you saw quite a lot of for most of these answers. Um, like I said before, I tried to make the questionnaire so that it would pull specific activities out of the Learning with Nature program um, so that I could measure specific activities. Uh, so my recommendation here is that to further encourage positive attitudes, build on and emphasize pieces of learning with nature, LWN is learning with nature, um, regarding tiny birds, discussing ecosystems with friends, and the importance of conservation for humans, which were three specific activities that I had in the questionnaire that luckily were positive. The third outcome was that hands-on interactions and a quiet environment impact students' attitudes toward nature on Ilo Zegret. <coughs> so um, this is coming from this is coming from the connection with nature theme and the um, the novelty of the ecosystem theme, um, where students were saying that. They were in awe of this new environment. They um, were moved by the peace of the island, things like that. Um, it's also the recommendation is coming from this and coming from that, uh, that answer that I said before at the beginning of the questionnaires that over a quarter of students would rather stay inside than be outside. I thought that was an interesting kind of dichotomy and difference, and I thought maybe perhaps um, the Learning with Nature program impacts students' attitudes toward this specific ecosystem, this specific island, rather than the main island of Mauritius. Um, so my recommendation here was to replicate a hands-on, reflective approach to environmental education with programs on the main island. 
so that uh, students could have the same appreciation for environments closer to their home um, throughout the country rather than just this specific teeny tiny little island. The fourth was that first-hand experiences with conservation impact students' attitudes towards conservation. So another promising outcome, um, this gives a nod toward attitudes toward conservation, which I was measuring. Um, and this is just saying that those, uh, those interactions, direct interactions with conservationists, Anila Zegret, um, asking questions and being curious about conservation itself is really uh, positively influencing those attitudes. So my recommendation here was to continue to encourage participant curiosity about an interaction with conservationists and with conservation itself, so plant propagation and things like that. And the fifth outcome is that students' attitudes toward nourishing ecosystems are impacted. Again, another one of those outcomes that I was measuring um, I pulled this from a few of the different themes that I had going on here. Uh, my recommendation was to continue observation activities with students to highlight the uniqueness of Elizabeth. So this was really coming from those times where the tour guide would sit down with the students, would have them reflect on the differences between the ecosystem on Yolozegret and their hometowns or other uh, natural places that they had visited on the main island. And speaking of reflections, I have some reflections of my own for this project. Um, the, so for this project and for me um, personally as well, the uh, first really had to do with language. So, um, like I said before, English is the official language of Mauritius. Many Mauritians know it, but many of the children who I worked with were not entirely comfortable speaking or writing in English. Um, I did not adequately prepare for that. That was my fault. Uh, and it did take them a bit longer to actually complete the questionnaires and, and truly understand what was going on there. Um, though they, they were able to complete them, which was good. But if I were to do this again, um, it would definitely be ben more beneficial to actually take the time and translate those questionnaires into Mauritian Creole or into French, something that they're more comfortable with, um, just so that it's not so intimidating for them. Um, another thing I would do differently is actually uh, interview some of the students that had gone on the program. I actually did do this over the summer. I only had the opportunity to interview four students and they were 19 and 20 years old. So it was quite far from that target demographic um, and it wasn't, it, it didn't seem appropriate to fit into this um, study per se. Um, and though the conversations were very, very insightful. <laughs> uh, I would have liked to have interviewed many more students because it was very, very helpful to get more of that insight. Um, I would also probably visit um, one or two of the schools before I came back and actually distributed the questionnaires um, just so that the students would see me and know that I'm not kind of this intruder in their space. Which it didn't seem like they thought that, but <laughs> you never know. Um, as far as personal growth, um, one of the biggest things for me was uh, the new forms of communication. So, and getting to know people. So, when I visited these schools and to interview the teachers and to give out the questionnaires, um, almost all of the teachers I met with would sit down with me, we would have a cup of tea, we would chit chat a little bit. Then they would take me on a tour of the schools, they would show me the classrooms, um, and then some of them actually brought me to the principal, we would have tea again, we would chit chat some more, <laughs> which is, you know, an homage to this 
very hospitable environment that Mauritius is. It's a very warm culture, very hospitable culture. Um, but it was also a wonderful reminder for me that my role is not always as a researcher. And it's very important to have these interactions and to have these informal chit chats and conversations with not only the stakeholders, but just locals, just people who have lived there their whole lives, just to get um, more, in a, more of an idea of the context of the place. I had read a ton about Mauritius before I went, but nothing was like actually being there, learning from people who had lived there. Um, so that was just a, a nice reminder for me. Um, and then I also was reminded that conservation is a very complex, full-time, busy, crazy job. <laughs> And if I needed help with what I needed to do, I needed to ask for it. Um, and this has always been a little bit difficult for me. So this summer was a really great way to remind me that this is important to do, that I can't wait for other people to come up to me. I have to be the one to be responsible for the responsibilities I put on myself. Um, and this was just a really interesting real world way of pushing me past my comfort zone in that area. That is all I have. Do you have any questions? <laughs> Thank you.